Let's consider our first example, a public goods game. There are n players who simultaneously choose a contribution C to a public good. The contribution is just some non-negative number. Utility of player i is simply the sum of all contributions multiplied by a factor gamma minus the own contribution of player i denoted by C i. The parameter gamma denotes the marginal per capita return of a contribution, and gamma is bigger than 1 over n and smaller than 1. This guarantees that for a selfish player it is individually rational to give nothing, while the sum of utility is maximized if all players give as much as possible. If a player contributes one more unit of money, his own monetary payoff is reduced by 1 minus gamma. Since a compliant player feels this utility of g if he violates a norm, the highest contribution that a compliant player can be induced to make is given by g divided by 1 minus gamma. Since the sum of payoffs is strictly increasing in the sum of contributions, a rule utilitarian norm prescribes compliers to contribute this maximum amount, g divided by 1 minus gamma. Complier optimal norms solve a trade-off. On the one hand, it is good to prescribe contributions because one player contributing benefits other compliers. On the other hand, contributions are bad because they transfer resources from compliant to selfish types. It is clear that if the fraction of compliers is very small and the fraction of selfish types is very large, it cannot be optimal for compliers to make any positive contributions, because it's very likely that only selfish players will benefit from the contributions. It is easy to show that positive contributions increase compliers' expected utility if and only if the compliers' share is above a threshold given by 1 minus gamma divided by n minus 1 times gamma. The numerator of 1 minus gamma is the cost of contributing one unit for a complier, and the denominator is the benefit that one unit of contribution gives to other players. Note that if the complier share kappa is below this threshold, then under rule utilitarian norms which always prescribe to give positive amounts, compliers have a negative expected utility. If the complier's share exceeds this threshold, then complier optimal norms prescribe to contribute g divided by 1 minus gamma. Otherwise, they are allowed to give nothing. Let's take a look at the comparative statics of contribution levels. If the marginal per capita return gamma is larger, then compliers are both more likely to contribute, and if they contribute, their contribution levels are larger. Their contributions are increasing in the marginal per capita return is quite a robust stylized fact in experiments. For a seminal paper, take a look at Isaac Walker, 1988. If we hold the marginal per capita return constant, then contributions are more likely if there is a larger number of subjects, which means a contribution has a larger total return. Experimentally, Isaac and Walker also show that contributions increase in the number of subjects, even though the results are less strong. Finally, contributions are complier optimal only if the fraction of compliers is sufficiently large. So one would predict that there could be a person who makes positive contributions in an environment where she knows that there is a lot of other people who make contributions, while if we move her to an environment where she knows that there are a lot of selfish people, she will contribute nothing. The experimental literature has established that contributions in a public goods game can substantially increase if players have the opportunity to punish non-contributors, even if the punishment is costly. I will show now that these results are also predicted by complier optimal and rule utilitarian norms. For simplicity, we assume that there are only two players. After players have contributed to the public goods, there will be now a second stage where players can reduce the other player's payoff. If a player reduces the payoff of the other player by an amount pi, he has to pay himself an amount phi pi, where phi is some positive constant. Clearly, a sequentially rational selfish player will never perform any punishment. The maximum punishment that a compliant player is willing to perform is again bounded by his small motivation g. It is simply given by g divided by phi, the marginal cost of punishment. Now consider a norm that prescribes to punish all contributions below some threshold cs with this maximum punishment pg, while higher contributions shall not be punished. If selfish types contribute cs, the cost of contribution is cs times 1 minus gamma. If they contribute 0 instead, the expected punishment is given by kappa 
times the maximum punishment pg. It follows that selfish types can at most be induced to contribute a level cs given by kappa times pg divided by 1 minus gamma. If punishment does not occur in equilibrium, compliers have no expected cost of punishments. Hence, in stage 1 they can be induced to contribute g divided by 1 minus gamma more than selfish types. Recall that g divided by 1 minus gamma was the maximum contribution level that compliers could be induced to make in the public goods gain without punishment technology. That compliers contribute more than selfish types is compliant optimal if and only if it were compliant optimal that compliers make positive contributions if there were no punishment technology. Hence, we find the following result. In every rule utilitarian and compliant optimal norm equilibrium, the punishment technology increases contributions of every type by CS, which is given by kappa times G divided by phi times 1 minus gamma. The comparative statics of contribution levels are quite intuitive. Contributions increase in the fraction of compliers kappa, in compliers moral motivation G, and in the marginal per capita return of contributions gamma. Furthermore, contributions decrease in the marginal cost of punishment phi. Note that our model predicts that on the equilibrium path punishment will never be conducted. This rather unrealistic result is due to the simplifying assumption that all players are rational and have common knowledge of the type distribution and of the norm. It is instructive to slightly relax these assumptions by allowing for small mistakes or irrational behavior. Assume that with a small probability epsilon, a player trembles and just picks some random contribution. If epsilon is small enough, it will still be optimal to induce selfish types to contribute CS, which is defined as before. Punishment will now occur with positive probability on the equilibrium path. Since punishment is costly, both for the punisher and the punished person, it is never optimal to punish stronger than is necessary to deter a selfishly rational person from that deviation. It is now easy to show that rule utilitarian and comply optimal norms prescribed to punish a contribution C that is below the target level CS with an amount that is proportional to the gap to the target level CS. This result on the punishment structure is again roughly in line with experimental results. For example, Ferngeschter 2000 show that punishment is stronger the more a contribution falls behind the average contribution level. Personally, I find it important to consider only norms that are robust at least to a small probability of mistakes or irrational behavior. Otherwise, one could have this uncomfortable prediction that it would be optimal to punish already small deviations very severely. But if there is a probability for mistakes, punishment should not be too large. It should just be important that selfish rational persons have no incentive to make such a deviation.